I'm Sam from Cultaholic.com and this is Graded for NXT and 205 Live where I take a look at each show segment by segment and award each little bit a grade from A plus to F and a lot has happened. I've been off for a couple of weeks, go away for a couple of weeks and everything changes. Uh, Adam Cole's the new NXT champion, Street Profits are the new NXT tag champions, I'm married to the man of my dreams. So yeah, without any further ado, hit the intro. So we kick things off with 205 Live as we always do, look at the lovely purple tie and out comes Akira Tozawa to the ring, he's, you know, coming down for a match, he's standing around in the ring, but who's his opponent? It's Noam Dar, except no it's not, because out comes Drew Gulak wearing all black and looking really menacing and angry, and he just beats him up, takes out his bad knee, drives him into the ring steps, out comes Drake Maverick, out come referees, everybody's getting in the way, Tozawa looks really angry that he's not going to have a scheduled match, points at Gulak, points at Maverick and goes, Give me the match. So the opening bout to this week's 205 Live is Akira Tozawa versus Drew Gulak. It's a really interesting match this one because Gulak takes a lot of punishment but it doesn't phase him. He just lets it wash all over him. Tozawa's just taking it to him and he's just getting back up like the Terminator and carrying on. Eventually Gulak manages to start the deconstruction of Akira Tozawa with a fall away slam, Joe Hendry, local hero. Tozawa keeps trying in vain to lock Gulak up, he goes for the octopus, he tries a lot of different things, but Gulak ain't playing that game, he just takes him straight back to the floor and keeps control. As I said, whenever Tozawa manages to get up and get on the front foot, Gulak just absorbs it and levels him, keeps him right where he wants him, and commentary are really trying to get across that this is a new Drew Gulak, a darker Drew Gulak driven by anger and hatred. There's a really cool moment, probably spot of the match, where Tozawa comes off the apron and hits a huge cannonball onto Gulak, who's on sort of the crowd barrier corner and he just looks really horrible when they connect. Tozawa follows this up with a dive that sends Gulak flying over the announce table but back in the ring he just can't get the job done. But that being said it's not like this is an easy job for Gulak, Tozawa is really really putting up a fight. He escapes a clover leaf. he doesn't even flinch following like a gut wrench suplex but ultimately Gulak connects with a superplex and a neck breaker to pick up the three. I'm gonna give this one a B plus, I'm really enjoying the idea of this darker more sadistic twisted Drew Gulak and I think that he's going to be able to get a lot done with this character. We've had a smug cocky heel in the form of Buddy Murphy but now we've got this sadistic twisted heel in the form of Gulak. It's something that we haven't really seen on 205 Live and I think it's going to add a lot of depth to the storylines. And when you look at it from just a pure reality standpoint the guy is so good with character work. I mean he's been so good for so long already in WWE. How is he not going to get this thing over? We then go to a backstage segment and it's Mike and Maria Kanellis and Mike says that he has finally proved he is the best in 205 Live after beating Brian Kendrick last week. And he tells Drake Maverick that he wants him to bring him the best cruiserweights that 205 Live has to offer because he wants to prove that he's worthy of a title shot. We then keep it backstage and Tony Nese is stopped in a corridor just walking back and forward with his belt like all champions apparently do backstage and he's asked about Drew Gulak's behaviour. Nice says that he's very aware of how dangerous Drew Gulak can really be but he's more disappointed in Drake Maverick for allowing that match to happen because he wanted to face a full fully healthy Akira Tozawa. He does finish off though by saying that if Maverick ever wants to send him Gulak, he just needs to let him know and he'll be ready. There's then a really, really, really weird backstage segment, I guess you can call it. It's a pre-record on a phone, it's Lucha House Party and they're all just sitting really close together. They plug Super Showdown, Super Showdown, Saudi Arabia, yes! And then they say when they're back from Super Showdown that they're, uh, they're gonna send the Sings back to Bollywood. And then we go back to the ring for tonight's main event, which is Oni Lorcan versus Arya Davari. Now we'll touch on this at the end, but I just felt that the match order tonight should have been the other way around. I feel like this match should have really opened the show. But that being said, it wasn't a bad match. It was actually a pretty good match, so let's go have a look. I loved this, but at the start of the match, there was like a full minute and a half of test of strength, but it was all right. Like, it would be boring usually, but it was all right because Davari was just being so smug about being in control. He's got Lorcan like on his knees and he's just hyper extending the arms and making it look really nasty and just being really smirky about it. The story of this match is that Lorcan is very much out wrestling Davari but Davari is using underhanded sneaky sneaky tactics to try and get the advantage. 
He almost hits a half and half on Davari pretty, pretty quickly into the match before taking it to the mat and keeping him firmly under control. There's also a pretty solid cross arm breaker, but Davari peels to the outside and starts playing mind games. A little bit into the match, Lorcan does also steal Marty Skull's finger snappy breaky things, which is a little bit weird. Davari goes for the Persian line splash at about the halfway mark. You know, he's not going to actually pick up the win with it if it was to connect, but Lorcan moves, and this allows Lorcan to hulk up and really get that big baby face comeback. Davari is intent on putting Lorcan away, though. He misses the hammerlock line. Lariat, the pair go back and forth, and then he's able to lock in the million dollar dream, which gets a little bit hairy. Lorcan looks like he's going to pass out, but eventually he gets out of it. And then we reach the ending of the match. Davari hits the Persian drop before hitting the Persian line splash, and just as it looks like he's going to pick up the win, he like leans back into the pin all cocky, lifting the leg with his right arm. Lorcan just shifts the weight, pinning Davari's shoulders and picking up the three. I love that ending because, as I said, you've got Lorcan sort of out wrestling him this entire time. And he's always sort of thinking one step ahead, whereas Davari's just focused on beating him to get the belt to earn more money. He doesn't want it for prestige, he wants it for money. And then post-bell, Davari tries to sprint at Lorcan, who low bridges, sending him sailing over the top rope, out of the ring and onto the ramp where they sort of stare at each other like, oh you, like that. As I said though, when I first started at this point, I think this match should have opened the show. It just felt a little bit more like an exhibition, and I think it had, you know, Drew Gulak coming back after a month absence and being all dark and healed. I think that would have been better as a big statement at the top of the show. So I'm only going to give this one a C plus. I was a big fan of the contrasting styles, Davari working a more sneaky opportunistic style in face of Lorcan's just pure wrestling approach. And Davari still looks desperate and just as angry as ever, so there's at least some storyline footing here. In terms of an overall grade for this week's 205 Live, I'm going to give it a B. I adored dark, twisted Drew Gulak, and I can't wait to see where it goes. But it just sort of felt a little bit disjointed, as I said, and it kind of, kind of like a bit of a nothing episode. There was a little bit of storyline traction here and there, but no major moments, other than, of course, Drew Gulak returning after a month-long absence. And now we move on to NXT, and this, of course, was an NXT Aftermath episode, which was taped before NXT TakeOver, so usually it's just a couple of dark matches, Matches. Usually they're a little bit eh and a bit full of, you know, clips and stuff of the event itself. But, you know, let's have a look. Let's see what it's like. We start things off with Keith Lee versus Kona Reeves. It's quite a fun opening segment to this match. Keith Lee keeps Kona Reeves under control with just one hand. Reeves is using both hands. And at the same time, Reeves is like 6'8". He's huge. He's bigger than Lee. But at the same time, it's funny just seeing Lee use one arm to just sort of control him. There's even a nice moment where Reeves tries to get out of the ring and Lee just lifts him back in with one arm over the top rope, right back into the predicament he was trying to escape. There's a moment where Reeves lands quite dodgy and starts clutching his knee and screaming and writhing around in pain and Keith Lee, being a sportsman, goes over and it was, of course, all a ruse and he eats a headbutt for his troubles. So from this point, it's a pretty, pretty quick match. Reeves is actually able to keep Lee grounded and under control for quite a while, but this allows him to have a mega, mega babyface comeback and that crowd adored Keith Lee. They were going absolutely wild. Lee manages to maintain wrist control, hits a standing crossbody. There's a little bit more back and forth. Then he hits a limit breaker and he picks up the three. Nice, easy victory for Keith Lee here. I'm going to give this one a B minus. Despite the fact it was a glorified squash, Reeves actually had a pretty good showing. I know I didn't make it sound that way, but he really did. There were moments where he had Lee under full control and he looked quite vicious. And then, of course, we had Lee's general athleticism and those great moments like when he was pulling him in the ring with one arm. It was just Class. I'm not going to treat these like backstage segments because they're just the WWE.com exclusive interviews, so I'll just run down what happened. Uh, these shows tend to have a lot of like recaps of what happened at TakeOver, a couple of clips of like each match as it goes by, and you know, it gives you a flavor and fills you in on what happened. But uh, there's a clip of Io Shirai looking angry backstage after a match with Shayna. Uh, we then get a recap package of Street Profits winning the belts at TakeOver, a recap package of Breeze versus Dream, where obviously Dream retained the North American title, and then we go to Tyler Breeze who says that he's gained a lot of respect for Dream, but the NXT landscape has changed, and it's changed forever because he's back, and he's back for good. And then we go back to the ring for tonight's main event, which is Mia Yim versus Bianca Belair, and this is different because there's actually a storyline leading up to this match. It's really, really interesting because they never tend to do this on the Aftermath episodes. It's just sort of like, here's some dark matches and some clips. 
So the story coming into this one is that Bianca Belair used her hair to gain leverage on the rope. Instead of clutching the rope, she wrapped her hair around it and pulled her hair, and that led to a victory over Mia Yim. Mia Yim went to Regal and was like, I want a bloody rematch. So, you know, this is what we're getting. So Yim looks very angry coming into this one. She definitely, definitely wants to get that win that she's earned. Both women have a really good showcase here. There's some nice little moments, nice little spots. One in particular I really like because it looked so effortless, and it's usually quite a difficult spot to make look effortless, is that Yim is sort of Irish whipped into the rope and then just changes direction around Bianca Belair like butter, like it's nothing. Like usually there's sort of an awkward moment where they turn, no, she just on a dime, just Boom, boom, 90 degree angle, it was great. While Yim is more of a brawler in this one, she's just desperate to get that win she's owed, she's very angry. Belair is thinking about it like a technician. She's working over the torso of Yim, and at certain points, like she's stretching, she's striking, she's planting, and there's a moment where she's like stretching her abdominal stretch style, and she's just digging her fingernails into it. It just, oh, it was great. It was like really good psychology to get that across, and commentary getting that across. It just felt like a really good moment. Yim attempts a cross arm breaker, and once Belair gets free, she sort of rolls to the outside. She then grabs Yim though around the ring post and continues to work that torso. It was horrible. Yim is able to pull her face first into the post though and gain the upper hand. But yeah, that spot where she was pulling around the ring post, it looked brutal, it looked desperate, it looked exactly like something Bianca Belair's character would do. They're still on the outside and she picks Yim up into that sort of double chicken wing thing she's got and it looks like she's going to drive her face first into the ring steps, but Yim rolls through, driving Belair face first into the ring steps. Back in the ring and a little later in the match, Yim hits a code blue after a tarantula and she almost picks up the three. Both of these women are so evenly matched, it's perfect. It's a really, really strong matchup here. There's then a great reversal into a guillotine from Yim before she hits an elevated protect your neck from the second rope to pick up the win. I'm gonna give this one an A minus. Both of these women have taken what felt like a really awkwardly put together feud and ran with it, being able to showcase their full abilities throughout. And I'd be more than happy to see this feud continue somewhere down the line. We then, after the match, go backstage to Drew Gulak, who's being interviewed, and this is after NXT last week. It's felt like an awkward place to put this one, but yeah, uh, I'm just going to refer to my notes on this one. Uh, he slags off Kashida, saying that Kashida can't be the best submission specialist in the world, as Gulak is. He runs him down for being a Back to the Future cosplayer, and in a moment I really liked, he said that everybody knows Biff's the hero of that story anyway. Gulak then challenges Kashida to a match next week on NXT TV, and it's a submission match to prove once and for all who is the better man. And then we close off NXT this week with, I guess, the sort of main event, but it's not really a, a main event. It's just a recap package of the main event of TakeOver 25. And, you know, it's good. It's got some cinematic footage in it and everything, but it's, it's, it's yeah, it, it's just a recap package. That's all it is. But overall, I am going to give this week's episode of 205 Live a B+. It's usually really hard to grade these post-TakeOver episodes because they feel a bit mashed together. But this one, this one had a bit of structure to it and I liked it. And unlike your usual post-TakeOver episode, episodes, we had some storyline conclusion here. Yim got her victory back over Belair, and both women have firmly cemented themselves, in my opinion, as the future of that company's women's division. Like, NXT's future women's division is going to be those two at the top. It has to be. And as I said, the Keith Lee Kona Reeves match had some nice little moments, and we got those lovely promo packages throughout, recapping everything that happened with all the extra cinematic footage that you don't get to see on TV. So yeah, Good episode. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you like what we do here at Cultaholic, you can check us out on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And no matter what you do, don't ever forget to hit subscribe and join us.